Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, TD Bank, Englewood Health, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, moving the region through air, land, rail, and sea, the Fidelco Group, Summit City, MD, a provider of primary, specialty, and urgent care. United Airlines, and by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Promotional support provided by Jaffe Communications, supporting innovators and changemakers with public relations and creative services. And by New Jersey Globe. Hi, this is Steve Adubato, obviously coming to you remotely. We've got uh, four terrific guests today. I want to kick off the program with uh, someone who's joined us before with really important information, Elaine Katz, Senior Vice President of Grants and Communications for Kessler Foundation. Good to see you, Elaine. Great to see you, Steve. <laughs> nice to be joining you remotely. I know, I know. Um, we're going to be doing this for a little while, I imagine. COVID-19 and people with disabilities, the impact it has been and will be, well, you know, it's really difficult to say. It's hard to get all the numbers together. Um, you know, the state of New Jersey isn't sure the numbers that's been affected, but it's clearly, um, when we looked at vulnerable populations, the first group did not include disability. Nobody was even thinking about disability. Um, and when, you, when I looked at numbers from the American University Centers on Disability, you know, there's about 56, 58 million Americans with disabilities. And if you added all their caregivers, um, other older adults, it's about 100 million, 104 million people that may be affected. About four in 10 Americans have some connection probably to someone with a disability that are really vulnerable, especially direct caregivers. You know, the survey, a survey was done, I believe in March of 2020, we're taping on the 16th of June. And this survey, really, a national survey looked at myths, if you will, I'm going to call them myths that people have about those with disabilities and employers who are looking to employ them, the employability of those with disabilities and attitudes of employers. Key findings are? Key findings are is that college is great for everybody, especially for young adults with disabilities that are between the ages of 18 and 24 and it's transitioning out of high school and want to know what to do with their lives. When you think about uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, recovery that's happening during the pandemic and the loss of jobs, it may, finding a job may be difficult even for somebody uh, with skills. So the, what we found is that college students with recent college graduates with disabilities between between ages 20 and 35, um, where 80% of them um, had a job at the type, time of the survey, and 90% of them had a job five years following college. So college clearly pays off for young adults with disabilities. You know, the other thing about Kessler Foundation, and we've been up to your location many times to do forums, to conduct forums, and I've moderated them. I've met so many extraordinary people, not just those who are in the clinical studies, or the studies that, that go on there, as well as the scientists, the, the participants. But the other thing is, there are grants that you provide. Now, when COVID hit, Kessler Foundation created a COVID-19 response fund. I believe the grants go from, their emergency funds from $5,000 to $40,000. Which organizations, which types of organizations do they go to and why? Well, you know, our, our trustees made a really important decision in March of 2020, and we converted our uh, a million two of current grant making only to local emergency funds, going to our grantees in the past few years, all focused on the disability community. Because as I mentioned before, that community was not being considered uh, for a lot of services, for protective um, equipment even. And when you think about disabilities, you know, all the services were stopped. So right. one of the 
one of the really big areas was remote and distance learning. So we paid a lot of um, dollars, invested a lot of dollars in that for organizations so they could continue services in the pandemic and really provide um, that continuity because there's a lot of isolation. People were um, isolating in group homes. They might have gone home to see family members. Um, the centers where they gathered, there were no services and it was really problematic. How about um, meal delivery? Meal delivery too, food preparation, um, food scarcity, um, direct service providers were often getting sick. They weren't there to help shop for individuals with disabilities, people with disabilities because of their vulnerability and some of the health, multiple health conditions they may have. Weren't even allowed into grocery stores originally because they weren't over, a lot of them weren't over age 60. And thankfully that's changed so they can go in with the seniors and shop as well. Final question here. The research, I know the research is so important at Kessler Foundation. How have research efforts and initiatives as we do this in mid-June, um, how have they been impacted by COVID-19? Well, most of our research studies, if they had a participant coming in, for example, we use an MRI scanner for some brain imaging studies. Those had stopped. But actually, if you visit our website, there are some tele-rehab studies. Say what it is, Elaine. Tele rehab. So no, distance no, the, the studies. website. The website. The website is KesslerFoundation.org. And if you visit our website, there's a COVID-19 page. And on it you'll find information about our research studies that are ongoing. And as of yesterday, June 15th, we are reopened for business, so to speak. So we've uh, equipped ourselves with PPE and we're taking all the precautions. We have extra cleaning on site. So research uh, participants are welcome to come in if they feel comfortable and resume their in-person studies. But for those who'd like to work online, there are some studies there as well. It's great stuff. I've been to the, the location that you have your office many times. I've done leadership development there. We've done seminars, as I've said. Um, really extraordinary work being done by you and your colleagues and the participants who help teach us so much. I look forward to being back on site with you and your colleagues. Uh, Elaine Katz, who is in fact the Senior Vice President of Grants and Communications for Kessler Foundation. Elaine, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, having me, Steve, and sharing our important work with everybody. You got it. Thanks, Elaine. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome back. I'm Steve Adubato. We are joined by Mitch Livingston, President and CEO of NJM Insurance Company one of the many underwriters of those of us in public broadcasting. Um, Mitch, let's get right to this. The role of an insurance company is complex, but also the role of the CEO. You and I talk leadership a lot. How has COVID-19 in any way altered or changed your leadership approach? Well, Steve, uh, the COVID situation uh, developed quickly. So from, from you know, end of February, into early March, uh, things were moving at a rapid pace, uh, made us rethink how we were uh, guaranteeing the safety of our employees. So we had to quickly, um, originally it looked like we would be modifying slightly, cleaning a little bit more, um, not shaking hands, keeping a little social distance, washing hands more often, but it was a manageable thing. Quickly uh, getting into March in about a 10-day period, it became way more than that. And we realized uh, we need to get employees home, we need to get them safe, and we needed to show some flexibility and support and, and make sure that we're doing right by them first so that we can ultimately serve policyholders. So from leadership, uh, we normally drive, we pick a date, we want to accomplish something, a goal and objective, we drive to that date. Um, here, we had to show flexibility, we had to show support, we had to make sure that we were um, changing with the changing times, right? So every week, everything changed a little bit. The decision you made Monday in March in the first week uh, was probably the wrong decision the second week because right. of changing circumstances. So we had to listen um, and we had to support and we had to make sure that we kept those lines of communication open. So it really changed um, the way we drove uh, business projects, but more importantly, the way we um, listened to our employees. But the other thing, Mitch, is talk about being flexible. It's interesting. Um, policyholders, you, you have a relief program, and I want to get this right. Was there a 15% reduction in premiums? Yeah, Steve, early on we realized uh, while we were adapting, so were our policyholders, and they were doing the right thing. They were sheltering in place uh, to support their own health, the health of their families, health of communities. 
which meant their cars are sitting in their driveways, right? Or in their garage, and they weren't going anywhere. Um, we've always shared profits with policyholders, uh, either through dividends or lower prices up front. Um, this was a way we recognized we were gonna be um, charging more premiums than, than, than we needed to charge because the cars weren't moving. So we were able to quickly decide um, over, over March and April that we'd give 15% of the equivalent of three months of premium back, uh, which ended up being about $42 million to our policyholders and checks that went out in May and June. Normally we would do a dividend at the end of the year, October, November, when we had more profit than we needed and we turned it always to prop policyholders. We've done it since 1918. But here we could get it back in our hands quickly when a lot of them need it um, from a financial perspective, some of them out of work, and, and make sure that we're doing the right thing in real time, uh, supporting them while they support themselves in the community. It's interesting. The other piece of this is the giving back. And again, I mentioned NJM, a big supporter of NJTV News, a supporter of what we do. Giving back, I'm not going to turn this into a commercial, but you give back. You just do. And there are about $400,000, if I'm not mistaken, as part of a COVID relief effort that went to not-for-profits. One of them we know is the Mercer Street Friends, a great organization. What was that about, and what are you trying to accomplish with that? So one of our core values has always been to support the communities we're privileged to serve. So we have a corporate giving budget of about $2.2 million every year that, that we support nonprofits in the area and in the expanding areas we're writing. Um, this year, we realized we needed to continue to support those nonprofits because it's frankly part of their operating budget. They, they account on it every year, so you can't just immediately divert money. So what we were able to do, though, is allocate about 400000 uh, of that money to COVID relief programs, uh, specifically to address the, the financial difficulties and, and other difficulties uh, people were facing, and also increase our budget a little bit this year to make sure we were, again, supporting those communities. But, but then again, some of that went to PPE, uh, to frontline workers. Some of it went to food distribution, if I'm not mistaken, created additional warehouse space. I happen to know, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but at Mercer Friends, um, Mercer Street Friends, you created ex an expanded warehouse for food to be there for distribution, correct? Yes. we. Is we that actually, the role of a corporation to do that? We have a storage facility that we use uh, down the street from Mercer Street Friends. Uh, when we became aware that they, they were and need, they're in Trenton, store. correct? They're in Trenton. Okay. We wanted to, they needed to store a little bit more food for their, their giving efforts going forward. We had excess space, so they reached out to us and we offered to let them use that facility, which we did. Um, we also, uh, to your point on the PPE, we had, um, going back a ways, about, about 5,000 masks, uh, surgical level masks that, that we had in storage here that we were able to give back to the state and some local hospitals uh, when, when we first learned of the need for that. So part of the part of the responsibility of a corporation, the way we've seen it, we always operated as a mutual from the day we were formed, is to help the community, to support the community, to interact with the community and be part of it. Frankly, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do, but it's also the right thing for our mission and, and the future of NGM. If, if we're part of the community, we're showing that outreach, we're doing what we need to do to support them. They become good policy holders. We develop long-lasting relationships. And that's, that's part of the reason we're in business. Mitch Livingston is uh, president and CEO of NJM Insurance Company. Mitch, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, wishing you and all of your team at NJM all the best. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome back. We're now joined by our longtime friend and colleague, Ryan Haygood, president and CEO of New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Ryan, you joined us on our Uncut series. We covered a lot of ground. We have more ground to cover. Let me ask you, we were talking about police, defunding the police, taking some of those dollars, using it in other places. You know, you know, and I know that there are many who are not part of this movement, who don't care very much about um, racial and social justice, at least don't appear to, and say, let's just say the president. I don't know what he's thinking and feeling, but he's like, look, Look at those liberals. They're leftists. They want to do away with the police. Don't you think on some level, Ryan Haygood, that that kind of language of do potentially doing away with the police, whether it's aspirational, a word you used last time or not, gives some credence to those with another point of view that frankly don't, doesn't help things? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I think it's first important for people to understand what that push is all about, right? So I think part of it is... Is it a dog whistle? It's not, it, it's not a dog whistle in the sense that it really is at its bottom about how you actually empower communities. So no, no, the, when Donald Trump says you see oh, what they yeah, are doing, absolutely. and then he says we need to dominate the streets, it's all about law and order. Right. They want to do, they want to do all, you, me, right. some others who are involved in protests, they want to do away with the police. Right. Is that a dog whistle? Well, and who is it a dog whistle to, to whom? That's absolutely a dog whistle. Uh, it's a dog whistle intended to double down on the very police practices that brought us to this moment. And Dare I, think I say in, Bull Connor. In this moment, to that point, I think we're required to do something very different than, than we've done. You know, you and I talked previously about how I came of age in the early 1990s. And on March 3rd, 1991, we saw Rodney King brutalized in California on video. And we couldn't imagine that 30 years later, we'd be having this very conversation about how police brutality has persisted over the years. And so I think what this moment calls for you, there's a lot of talk about well, what does it mean to defund police? Part of what I think folks should understand is that that's a, that's a broad aspirational strategy to think about how you make different kinds of investments in communities. So if you invest very deeply in policing, as many of our cities do, the country spends more than $115 billion every year in law enforcement. If you make deep investments in policing, you will make deep investments in incarcerating people. If you make deep investments in empowering communities on front end services that empower schools, libraries, parks, right. community-based programming, you will empower communities in a way that you need at a minimum fewer police, fewer interactions with police, and you'll be dispatching police in the most serious cases. Right now, Steve, we, we dispatch police for all manner of things that have nothing to do with police functions. Let me twist this around a little bit. Let me change a little bit. Um, there was an author, I believe, at Princeton University who was on the Today Show as we're doing this program on the 18th of June. It'll be seen later. She wrote a great essay in The Atlantic, and I'm drawing a blank on her name. And she said, uh, black people do not want pity from white people. Mm -hmm. We want people to understand. We want people to be compassionate and mm -hmm. empathetic and care about making change, but not pity. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? I love that point. I mean, I think what we want in white folks, we want allies. You know, very often when we, and I, I appreciate this conversation, Steve, because very often when we have conversations specific to black people, white folks tune out. And so that's a black person's issue. Black folks will champion. It's them. not our, it's not our issue. It doesn't relate to us, right? I don't fully yeah. understand the black lives matter piece. I mean, yes, I get it in principle, but what does that really mean? And here's what black lives matter really means that we get allies, white allies, who previously maybe have been standing on the sideline to join with us in champion, championing real reforms, real policies, real changes that actually make deep investments in black communities. So there's been no social movement in this country that has advanced powerfully without a multiracial coalition. So right now, I think what this moment requires, that black folks have always championed black causes, right? We've been at the forefront of those it will continue to be, but what we haven't always enjoyed is allyship from white folks who can go to circles that we can't go to. I wanna say this to you, Steve. Two weeks ago, I joined a Zoom call uh, where I was talking to a funder, a white woman. At the top of the conversation, Steve, she says to me, and I could tell she had been, been crying before a call. She says, Ryan, I, I wanna start by saying this to you. I can't imagine how difficult it must be to be a black man in America right now. I've been alive 45 years, Steve. I've been black the whole time. I've interacted with a lot of folks. I've never had an interaction like that. And what that said to me, and I took that to be very sincere, she was genuine, was that we're getting to a place where white people are starting to understand the difficulty of being black in this country. It's a beautiful thing. I don't want folks to mistake what I'm, what I'm, mix, mistake what I'm saying. It's a beautiful thing to be black, but it's also very difficult. We've seen that play out on TVs more recently, but certainly over the last several years. So part of what this moment requires is for white folks to join in struggles to champion specific causes that empower black people, principally, and of course have benefits to everybody. But the harm visited upon black people is very specific and requires allyship from white folks who advance changes around those issues. On that note, uh, Ryan, the other thing that we need to do is I mentioned in our, uh, when we did our uncut segment that you and I, together with Micheline Davis and, and Roz Baraka, the mayor of Newark, and also the police director, public safety director, Anthony Ambrose in Newark, and so many others, 
we gather together at a forum in Newark to deal with police minority relations. We have to figure out how we're going to have a forum like that. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's going to be on Zoom. We will not be in the same room. Mm -hmm. But we have to have that conversation again. But anyone who says we did, we already covered race. We already covered racism and check off the box. I'm not going to get on a soapbox, but that's what confronting racism is. It's saying it is not a segment. It's not a show. It's not a one-off. You don't check off the box. It's an ongoing commitment. There is so much work to do. Ryan, thank you so much sure. for joining us. Um, and I look forward to every conversation we have. All the best, Ryan. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome back, folks. We are pleased to be joined uh, once again by Chris Calori, CEO, Cooper's Ferry Partnership down in Camden. Good to see you, Chris. Good to see you, Steve. A real quick description of Cooper's Ferry. Cooper's Ferry is a, uh, a economic development and community development nonprofit that's been around for 34 years in the city of Camden. And one of the areas, by the way, we were down in Camden, did a special about what's going on there, all the changes and a lot of the improvements. But one piece of this, COVID-19, it's almost like COVID-19 and X. COVID-19 and pollution, what is the issue and why does it matter so much in Camden? For those who have known uh, about Camden for a while, you've known that pollution is a problem that we've confronted with. Uh, if you, I, I, before I came uh, on the show, I went on the governor's website to see some of the causes uh, of death directly related to COVID. Uh, you look at chronic diseases, you've seen uh, cardiovascular disease, you've seen lung disease, these are uh, some of the causes that have directly impacted the city of Camden well before COVID. And COVID, what it's done is amplified some of these problems. And the deaths that you've seen as a result of COVID are ready and self-evident to those who live in the city. How are you dealing? How are you and your colleagues at Cooper's Ferry Partnership helping to deal with this issue? So th there's multiple areas that uh, Cooper's Ferry is playing a role in. Number one, uh, we are directly uh, helping set up COVID testing sites. We've set up three testing sites thus far, and over 4,500 people have been tested, 50% of which are Camden residents. Second, uh, we have collected tangentially, but we facilitated almost 1,500 laptop purchases for high school students in Camden. Third, we think transportation, Steve, and you know I'm a transportation guy, is a very important issue for those people who need to get to jobs even in this environment, but don't have access to transportation. So we have provided free transportation through shuttle bus services for those people who need to get to job. And the final and the fourth thing is we have worked with farmers against hunger yeah. in New Jersey to give up uh, food, fresh produce to the residents of Camp. Chris, in limited time, we, limited time we have, I want to help people understand this. Camden is a unique story, and I suggest people check out our colleagues at NJTV to find out more. They've, they've done so many stories about Camden. Real quick on this, Camden's had protests like so many others in connection with um, racial injustice, racism, if you will, police minority relations. The, the head of the police department in Camden was shoulder to shoulder with the protest right from the beginning. That's right. And, and I think this is a direct result of the reforms, uh, Steve, that were put into place in 2013. President Obama visited Camden uh, and held Camden as a promise of symbol for the nation. And there's a reason for it. Uh, people are talking about uh, disparities and social injustice and injustice in the criminal system. What the police chief and his colleagues have done is to engage the community before there was a crisis, not after there was a crisis. I think that is a direct result of community policing and making sure that the residents know the police are there as partners and not just a law and order entity that is there to solve a problem when a problem occurs. Chris, I want to follow up on something. So many people have said what they've learned from this, what the bigger lessons are. And, and we're, again, in the second inning of a nine-inning game, so people who think it's on the back end, think again. Biggest takeaway for you from this COVID-19 experience to date as we're doing this on the 16th of June? Is the social disparities and the economic disparities that have led us to where we are today. Look, the pandemic started far away from where we live and where we work, 
but the impact has been completely transparent and frankly eye-opening. Uh, for those who want to see uh, how we're gonna solve this problem going forward, uh, I think the virus in many ways, unfortunately, and in some ways, instructively, given us a lens on how to bridge the uh, socioeconomic inequities that exist in a place like Camden. But real quick, part of the Camden has lost some folks. With us, and we've lost 51 residents. Uh, but I, I want to say this to you, Stephen. You've been a, a student and observer of Newark and other cities in the, in, the, in the state of New Jersey. The progress that Camden has made in the last seven years is real. Uh, but we are dealing with almost 50 years of social isolation and uh, economic disparities and social disparities. It is going to take time for us to correct. This crisis gives us a better roadmap, perhaps, uh, now. And unfortunately, we have to lose 51 people in order to get to this lesson. But I think it's still a valuable lesson. And finally, you're a nonprofit. We're a nonprofit. If we're not for corporations and foundations, where would we be? Uh, we would be completely lost, and uh, and I will tell you, uh, this crisis has shown where the strength of the foundations and support structures are, and the the organizations that are support both our organizations uh, count among the best that understand their mission, but but more importantly, understand what we're trying to do on the ground. Chris Kaluri, uh, CEO of Cooper's Ferry Partnership. Chris, all the best to you and our friends and colleagues down in Camden. Take care, my friend. Thank you so much. I'm Steve Adubato. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, TD Bank, Englewood Health, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the Fidelco Group, Summit City MD, United Airlines and by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Promotional support provided by Jaffe Communications and by New Jersey Globe. It only gets better when we stand together to tough through to get by even though it's harder than ever cause we're gonna make it long as we don't No.